of the RSS conference, and I have the pleasure of the company of your Benjamini. Um, your, you've um, just given a, re a retrospective red paper. Uh, what is it? What is the idea of the meeting? That's, I guess, one of the first of the kind. Well, for me, even a red meeting was a strange thing because I never attended one. I didn't have the experience of running to an oral representation with people then arguing in favor of you and opposing your point of view. So that was a very special experience. Uh, what I understand that uh, we read paper or retrospective read paper is even new to the members of this uh, society now. And the idea was uh, to take a paper which when it was published didn't seem to be that important. And now, retrospectively, 15 to 14 years later, it does look uh, important and influential. And I had uh, the pleasure to be elected or chosen to, to, be, to present the first one of these, following my paper with uh, Yossi Hochberg, which was published in 1995 in the uh, Journal of the Royal Soci Statistical Society B. So could you maybe say a couple of words about the, the topic? It's, it was on the discovering the false discovery rate. The false discovery rate, right. The false discovery rate is um, actually a new point of view about the problem of uh, multiple comparison or the issue of simultaneous and selective inference. And that is uh, the infiltration of errors when you're doing many, many tests. And so just assuring that you don't do an error at level 0.05 is not enough. And uh, the ongoing uh, view was that you have to control the probability of making even one error. And uh, against it was the view that you shouldn't care it at all. You shouldn't care about it at all. So it was either don't worry, be happy, and do a 0.05 level testing, or on the other side, beware and protect yourself all the way through. And the false discovery rate presents an intermediate approach where we count the number of errors that we make out of the number of discoveries that we make, and we need to try to bound that at a reasonable level. And uh, what happens is that the, uh, it was quite difficult, and before being published at uh, the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, uh, it was turned down by a few journals for five years, and the original work didn't appear until 10 years after the first, we first wrote this paper. Um, but uh, it came and, uh, and turned out to be extremely useful in the modern era of genomics research, of fMRI research, where simply the problems grow to be huge. And when we screen, to find genes that are associated, or genes expression that are associated with diseases. We're working with 100,000 tests, 400,000 tests. In my own experience, we ran 2.2 million tests. And then you find a handful, you know, a few genes. Well, can you believe that what you have at the end in the end is not merely rubbish, false discoveries? And so the false discovery rate offers a way to weed out um, these false discoveries and be sure that you have a few reasonable ones. So your experience shows that it pays out to be persistent? With... With If you think that the subject is really important, you, even if you right, and wait what, for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, and what I... Yeah, I was uh, quite confident at that time that it will be. <laughs> and, uh, uh, useful to people, and in fact, that it's been uh, useful in drug discovery, in, uh, uh, but also in astronomy and in, uh, in um, brain research and uh, psychology and all, all around things. But interestingly, uh, it also came out to be interesting intellectually, uh, leading to major advances like in testimation, the fact that it's worthwhile to first test and then only estimate what you what you pass the threshold of testing, and it turned out to be important in model selection, and turns out to be um, important in um, by allowing other error rates that people find now uh, important and are also in between the two 
extreme um, points of view, and there are quite a few uh, variants of false discovery rates. So there's a whole list of false discovery types of false discovery rates that people investigate and um, use. And so in that in that uh, sense, it led to a whole new. Uh, stream of uh, very interesting research, not only in application, but also in research. When I was looking at the gene expression data, it wasn't only the false discovery rate, which seems to be important, but the complement, the false non-discovery rate. I don't know if you, sort of the, the equivalent of the power of the test. I don't know, are you aware if there has been any research in that area? Yeah, the, uh, first of all, the false non-discovery rate serves as a measure of our success in discovering. The smaller it is, the more we meant to discover, and especially in uh, theoretical research, it is um, comparing different methods and so on. We use the false non-discovery rate uh, as a measure of our success. Uh, there are a few incidents of people who try to use it positively, that is in some uh, phylogenetic trees analysis and so on, to try to control the force positive rate, where things where you want to make really statements and you want to try positive statement and you would try to control the number of these. But uh, um, I'm not aware of any particular success in the application part of it. Uh, that's way to be done. Thank you. So, uh, well, as David Cox mentioned in his introductory talk, that the experience of giving a red paper can be quite nerve-wracking. So I'm glad to hear that you enjoy it, I hope. and uh, I did indeed. And I thank, uh, I thank the society for uh, giving me the opportunity of uh, doing that. That was, for me, um, a way to recollect what happened this 15 years ago and go through the process again. But it was an enjoyable journey this time. Thank you very much.